marginal standing facility and the bank rates, they stand at 6.75%. The MPC also decided by a majority of five out of six members to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that inflation progressively aligns with the target while supporting the supporting growth. Let me now explain the MPC's rationale for these decisions on both policy rate as well as the stance. The MPC recognized that the pace of global economic activity is expected to decelerate in 2023. That's in the current year. And this is mainly because it is getting dragged down by elevated inflation, tight financial conditions, and geopolitical tensions, which are still continuing. The pace of monetary tightening has slowed in recent months, but uncertainty remains on its future trajectory as inflation continues to rule above targets across the world. And in the last few days, you would have noticed that uh, two major central banks have, uh, after adopting a pause for several months, they have gone for uh, uh, increasing the policy rates. So therefore, what I am saying is that uh, the monetary policy, the pace of monetary policy has slowed, tightening of monetary policy has slowed down. But uncertainty remains on the future trajectory as inflation continues to roll above targets across the world. In India, consumer price inflation eased during March-April 2023 and moved into tolerance band, declining from 6.7% last year, that is 22-23. Headline inflation, however, is still above the target as per the latest data and is expected to remain so according to our projections for 23-24. So when I say headline inflation is still above the target, I'm referring to headline inflation as per our assessment will remain above 4% throughout 23-24. Therefore, close and continued vigil on the evolving inflation outlook is absolutely necessary especially as the monsoon outlook and the impact of El Nino remain uncertain. Real GDP growth in 2022-23, on the other hand, turned out to be stronger than anticipated and is holding up well. The policy repo rate has been increased by 250 basis points since May last year and is still working its way through the system. Its fuller effects will be seen in the coming months. Against this backdrop, the MPC decided to keep the policy repo rate unchanged at 6.5%. The MPC will continue to remain vigilant on the evolving situation and the growth outlook. It will take further monetary policy actions promptly and appropriately as required to keep inflation expectations firmly anchored and bring down inflation to the target. With the policy repo rate at 6.5% and full year projected inflation for 23-24 at just a little above 5%, the real policy rate continues to be positive. The average system liquidity, however, is still in surplus mode and could increase as rupees 2,000 banknotes get deposited in the banks. Headline inflation, as noted before, is easing but rules above the target, warranting close monitoring of the evolving price dynamics. Taking all these factors into account, the Monetary Policy Committee decided to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that inflation progressively aligns with the target while supporting growth. Uh, I would now proceed to provide our assessment of growth and inflation. Let me first focus on growth. India's real gross domestic product, that is real GDP, recorded a growth of 7.2% in 2022-23, stronger than the earlier estimate of 7%. It has surpassed its pre-pandemic level by 10.1%. Real GDP growth in the fourth quarter of 
2022-23 accelerated to 6.1% year on year from 4.5% in the third quarter of last year, aided by fixed investment and higher net exports. On the supply side, real gross value added, that is GVA, accelerated from 4.7% in Q3 to 6.5% in Q4, driven by rebound in manufacturing activity, which moved into expansion territory after two quarters of contraction. Turning to 23-24, domestic demand conditions remain supportive of growth on the back of improving household consumption and investment activity. Urban demand remains resilient with indicators such as passenger vehicle sales, domestic air passenger traffic, and credit cards outstanding posting double-digit expansion on year-on-year -year basis in the month of April. Rural demand is also on a revival path. Motorcycle and three-wheeler sales increased at a robust pace year-on-year -year in April, while tractor sales remained subdued. Growth in steel consumption and cement output and production and imports of capital goods suggest continued buoyancy in investment activity. On the back of double-digit growth of 15.6% in non-food bank credit, the flow of resources to commercial sector in the current year, that is 2023-24, up to May 19th, increased to 2.7 lakh crore from 1 lakh crore during the same period last year. Fixed investment by manufacturing companies expanded in 22-23, reversing the contraction seen in 21-22. Our surveys also point towards higher investment intentions of manufacturing companies for 23-24, that is for the current year. The contraction in merchandise imports outpaced that of merchandise exports in April, resulting in a narrowing of trade deficit. Coupled with sustained and strong growth in services exports, the drag from net exports on growth is easing. On the supply side, the eight core industries output expanded by 3.5% year-on-year in April, compared with 3.6% in the month of March. The Purchasing Managers Index, that is PMI for manufacturing, exhibited sustained expansion, rising to 58.7 in the month of May, which is a 31-month high. Available high-frequency indicators suggest that services sector activity has remained on an accelerating trajectory. PMI services remained in strong expansion at 61.2 on top of 62 in April. Looking ahead, higher rubby crop production, expected normal monsoon, continued buoyancy in services, and softening inflation should support household consumption. On the other hand, given the healthy twin balance sheets of banks and corporates, supply chain normalization, and declining uncertainty, conditions are now favorable for the capex cycle to gain momentum. Robust government capital expenditure is also expected to nurture investment and manufacturing activity. Consumer and business outlook surveys display continued optimism. The headwinds from weak external demand, volatility in global financial markets, protracted geopolitical tensions, and intensity of El Nino impact, however, pose downside risks to the outlook so far as growth is concerned. Taking all these factors into consideration, the GDP, the real GDP growth for 2023-24, that is for the current year, is projected at 6.5%, with Q1 at 8%, Q2 at 6.5%, Q3 at 6%, and Q4 at 5.7% with risks evenly balanced. Let me just 
give the figure once figures once again. So the GDP growth, real GDP growth projection for the current year 23-24, uh, uh, the projection that we are making is 6.5 percent, and the quarterly breakup is as follows. The first quarter, the estimate is that it would be 8 percent, second quarter 6.5 percent, third quarter 6 percent, and fourth quarter 5.7 percent, and the risks are evenly balanced. Uh, let me now turn toward to inflation. Headline CPI inflation has come down during March-April 2023 to 4.7% in April, the lowest reading since November 2021. Monetary policy tightening and supply-side measures contributed to this process. The easing of inflation was observed across food, fuel, and core that is the CPI uh, excluding food and fuel categories. That means all categories of uh, headline inflation witnessed, uh, you know, witnessed uh, uh, what you call easing of the inflation pressures. Food inflation declined to 4.2 percent in April, while core inflation moderated to 5.1 percent. A durable, a durable disinflation in core component would be critical for a sustained alignment of the headline inflation with the target. Going forward, with the recent rubby harvest remaining largely immune to adverse weather events, the near-term inflation outlook looks more favorable than at the time of the last MPC meeting in April. The forecast of a normal southwest monsoon by the Indian Meteorological Department, IMD, augurs well for the Kharif crops. Uncertainties, however, remain on the spatial and temporal distribution of monsoon and the interplay between El Nino and the Indian Ocean Dipole. Geopolitical tensions, uncertainties around the monsoon and international commodity prices, especially sugar and uh, rice and also crude oil, and the volatility in global financial markets pose upside risks to inflation. Taking into account these factors and assuming a normal monsoon, CPI headline inflation is projected at 5.1 percent for 23-24, with Q1 at 4.6 percent, Q2 at 5.2 percent, Q3 at 5.4 percent, and Q4 at 5.2 percent. The risks are evenly balanced. As noted in the April statement, the decision to pause was based on the need to assess the cumulative impact of past monetary policy actions while charting out our future course. Subsequent incoming data suggest that while risks to near-term inflation have moderated somewhat, pressures remain uh, during the second half of the year, which needs to be watched and addressed at the appropriate time. According to our survey, inflation expectations of households for three months to one year ahead horizon have moderated by 60 to 70 basis points since September 2022. This would indicate that anchoring of expectations is underway and that our monetary policy actions are yielding the desired results. This also provides us the space to keep the policy rate unchanged in this meeting of the MPC. At the same time, given the uncertainties, we need to maintain Arjuna's eye on the, infl on the evolving inflation scenario. Let me re-emphasize that headline inflation still remains above the target and being within the tolerance band is not enough. Our goal is to achieve the target of 4 percent going forward. As Mahatma Gandhi had said, the ideal must not be lowered. The continuation of stance of withdrawal of accommodation should be seen from this perspective. I would now like to turn to liquidity and financial market conditions. Surplus liquidity has, as reflected in average daily absorptions under the LAF at rupees 1.7 lakh crore 
during April May was lower than 2.9 lakh crore rupees during the full year 22-23. The shrinkage in surplus liquidity during April May was among other things due to maturing of the TL TROs which we had extended which we had given during uh, COVID uh, times. The seasonal expansion in currency in circulation and build up of government cash balances during this period also moderated surplus liquidity. Since the third week of May, however, the decline in currency in circulation and pickup in government spending have expanded system liquidity. This has got further augmented due to the Reserve Bank's market operations and the deposit of rupees 2000 banknotes in the banks. The prevalence of surplus liquidity amidst higher recourse to marginal standing facility MSF by some banks suggest skewed liquidity distribution within the banking system. To address this situation, the Reserve Bank conducted a 14-day variable rate auction, that is a VRR auction, amounting to rupees 50,000 crore as part of its main operation on May 19, 2023, similar to two such auctions conducted earlier in February and March this year. Reflecting swiftness in its liquidity action, the Reserve Bank conducted a 14-day variable rate reverse repo auction. The earlier one I referred to was variable rate repo auction. Now I am referring to variable rate reverse repo auction, which is VRRR. So reflecting the swiftness in its liquidity action, the Reserve Bank conducted a 14-day variable rate reverse repo auction, that is a VRRR auction of 2 lakh crore on June 2nd. And thereafter, we have gone on to conduct a four-day VRR auction of 1 lakh crore on June 5th, a three-day VRR auction of 75,000 crore yesterday, that, sorry, day before, that is on June 6th, and a two-day VRR operation auction, let me say, a VRR auction of 75,000 crore on June 7th. Now, this was done considering the overall buildup of surplus liquidity. The response to these auctions, these VRR auctions, has been cautious in, uh, you know, as per, the later, as per our experience, that is, these VRR auctions, which we conducted over a period of last four or five days, the response from the banks has been fairly cautious. Going forward, the Reserve Bank will remain nimble in its liquidity management while ensuring that adequate resources are available for the productive requirements of the economy. The Reserve Bank will also ensure the orderly completion of the government market borrowing program in the current year. The moderation in system liquidity along with its skewed distribution was reflected in firming up of money market rates even beyond the repo rate on a few occasions before they came down from May 18 to sub-repo rate levels. Long-term rates have, however, remained broadly stable. This has led to sharp compression of term spreads in the recent period. The relative stability of long-term yields augurs well for the economy and suggests effective anchoring of market-based long-term inflation expectations. I would now like to uh, briefly talk about the external sector. In recent months, the trade deficit has narrowed on the back of sharper decline in imports vis-a-vis -vis exports. India is making resolute strides to achieve the $1 trillion merchandise export target by 2030 by focusing on diversification of markets and products, leveraging free trade agreements, strengthening manufacturing capacity and competitiveness by participating in value chains, and through schemes such as the production-linked incentive across sectors. Service exports and remittances have provided valuable support to India's external sector viability. During 22-23, services exports grew faster at 27.9% than merchandise exports, which grew by 6.9%. Uh, 
the current account deficit that is uh, is expected to have moderated further in Q4 22-23 and should remain eminently manageable even in 23-24, that even in the current year also. On the financing side, foreign portfolio investment, that is FPI flows, have seen significant turnaround this year since April, that is in 23-24, uh, led by equity flows. The net FPI inflows stand at US dollar 8.4 billion during the current financial year up to 6th of June as against net outflows in the preceding two years and the net outflows in the preceding two years were uh, US dollar 14.1 billion in 21-22 and 5.9 billion last year in 22-23. Net FDI flows to India were $28 billion in 22-23 compared to $38.6 billion in the previous year. Preliminary data for April 23 suggest that FDI flows have also improved. Net inflows under non-resident deposits, net resident inflows under non-resident deposits increased to $8 billion during 22-23 from $3.2 billion in the previous year. The Indian rupee has remained stable since January this year. Overall, India's external sector remains resilient as key indicators such as current account deficit to GDP, external debt to GDP, and international investment position, IIP to GDP, all these ratios continue to improve. Foreign exchange reserves stood at a comfortable level of US dollar 595, 595.1 billion US dollars as on 2nd June this year. Inclusive of net forward assets, our foreign exchange reserves are well above 600 billion US dollars. I shall now announce certain additional measures. There are about eight additional measures, and I think all of them are uh, quite important. So I request your patience for. Uh, some more time. The first announcement relates to borrowing in call and notice money markets by scheduled commercial banks. The extent regulatory guidelines prescribe prudential limits for outstanding borrowing in call and notice money markets for scheduled commercial banks. With a view to providing greater flexibility for managing their liquidity, it has been decided that scheduled commercial banks, exclu excluding small finance banks, can set their own limits for borrowing in call and notice money markets within the prescribed prudential limits for interbank liabilities. Second announcement relates to widening the scope of framework for resolution of stressed assets. Compromise settlements is recognized as a resolution mechanism in respect of non-performing assets, that is NPAs, under the prudential framework of the Reserve Bank, which is currently applicable to scheduled commercial banks and select NBFCs. It is proposed to issue comprehensive guidelines on comprehensive settlements and on technical write-offs, which will now be made applicable to all regulated entities, including the cooperative banks. Further, it is also proposed to rationalize the existing prudential norms on restructuring of borrower accounts affected by natural calamities. The next announcement relates to a default loss guarantee arrangement in digital banking, popularly what is known as the FLDG in digital banking. The Reserve Bank had issued the regulatory framework for digital lending in August, September last year. With a view to further promoting responsible innovation and prudent risk management, it has been decided to issue guidelines on default loss guarantee arrangements in digital lending. This will further facilitate orderly development of digital lending ecosystem and enhance credit penetration in the economy. Uh, the next announcement relates to priority sector lending targets for primary urban cooperative banks. The Reserve Bank has undertaken 
several initiatives in recent years to strengthen the urban cooperative bank sector that is the UCB sector as well as to deepen financial inclusion. Such initiatives include revision of the priority sector lending targets for UCBs in 2020. While revising the priority sector lending targets, a glide path up to March 2024 was provided for a non-disruptive transition to achieve the revised targets. While a number of UCBs, that is urban cooperative banks, have met the required milestones as on March 2023, a need has arisen to ease the implementation challenges faced by the other UCBs. It has therefore been decided to extend the time frame for achieving the targets by two more years, that is up to March 2026. Further, urban cooperative banks, UCBs, which have met the targets as on 31st March 2023, shall be suitably incentivized. The next announcement relates to rationalization of the licensing framework for authorized persons under Foreign Exchange Management Act, that is FEMA. The licensing framework for authorized persons issued under FEMA was last reviewed in March 2006. Keeping in view the developments, including progressive liberalization under FEMA over the last several years and to effectively meet meet the emerging requirements of the rapidly growing Indian economy, it has been decided to rationalize and simplify the licensing framework for these authorized persons. This is expected to improve the efficiency in delivery of foreign exchange facilities uh, to various segments of users, including common persons, tourists, and businesses. Uh, the next announcement relates to expanding the scope and reach of e-rupee vouchers. At present, purpose-specific e-rupee digital vouchers are issued by the banks. It is now proposed to expand the scope and reach of e-rupee vouchers by permitting non-bank prepaid payment instruments issuers, that is PPI issuers, to issue e-rupee vouchers. It is also proposed to enable issuance of e-rupee vouchers on behalf of individuals and to simplify the process of issuance, redemption, and a few other uh, you know, aspects of the current uh, framework. These measures will make the benefits of e-rupee digital voucher accessible to a wider set of users and further deepen the penetration of digital payments in the country. Next announcement relates to streamlining the Bharat bill payment system processes and membership criteria. The Bharat bill payment system, that is BBPS, is operational since August 2017. The scope of BBPS was further expanded in December 2022, that is December last year. To further enhance the efficiency of the BBPS system and to encourage greater participation it is proposed to streamline the process flow of transactions and membership criteria for operating units. Uh, the next announcement, and I think that's the last one, relates to internationalizing issuance and acceptance of the rupee cards. Rupee debit and credit cards issued by the banks in India are gaining increased acceptance abroad. It has now been decided to permit issuance of rupee prepaid forex cards by the banks. This will expand the payment options for Indians traveling abroad. Further, rupee cards will also be enabled for issuance in foreign jurisdictions. These measures will expand the reach and acceptance of rupee cards globally. Let me now conclude, and uh, there are some important messages in this concluding para. So. Uh, I request again your patience for just a couple of minutes. We have made good progress in containing inflation, supporting growth, and maintaining financial and external sector stability. Despite three years of global turmoil, India's growth has bounced back and headline CPI inflation is easing. This confluence of factors gives us the confidence 
that our policies are on the right track. Nevertheless, we need to move towards our primary target of 4% inflation. It is always the last leg of the journey which is the toughest. I wish to emphasize that we will do whatever is necessary to ensure that long-term inflation expectations remain firmly anchored. The best contribution of monetary policy to the economy's ability to realize its potential is by ensuring price stability. The Reserve Bank will remain watchful and proactive in dealing with the emerging risks to price and financial stability. Let me end by recalling the inspiring words of Mahatma Gandhi. If we are determined, we shall find the way that leads us to our goal. Thank you. Namaskar.